Hello, I'm Jess. And I'm Andrew. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater. And we get drunk on a hard cider. Yes, we do. Hey, Jess, you want to hear a joke? Of course I do. I always want to hear a joke. Okay. Um, four Jews, two gays, and two lesbians walk into a bar. Okay. AIDS. <laughs> uh, uh, never, uh, never invite AIDS to a party. All right. Well, we're talking about rent again this week, so. <laughs> no, no. Andrew, what are we really talking about this week? We're talking about falsettos, man. This is falsettos. This is falsettos land right now. Four Jews in a room plot a crime. I'm bitching. He's bitching. They're bitching. We're bitching. Bitch, 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 bitch. Funny, 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 funny. Bitch, 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 bitch. All the time. So let's talk a little bit about falsettos and what exactly it is. You ready for the very brief history? Oh, run it by me. Falsettos is actually two one-act plays that were squeezed together to make the full two-act musical. It is the second two parts of a trilogy, um, the first being In Trousers. The first first show is called March of the Falsettos, which was released in 1981 and written by William Finn and directed by James Lapine. The second one was called Falsetto Land, which was released many years later in 1990. Um, written in reaction to the newly developed AIDS crisis, which took over a lot of things. Um, so he figured just pick up those same characters as opposed to telling a new story or opposed to telling um, a brand new story with brand new characters. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious when you watch it, too. Yeah, it feels that way in the same way that Into the Woods feels like two very distinct stories put together. But I don't see them as very disconnected i feel like one kind of accidentally sets up the other very well in this one yes the, i feel that the entire um full musical entitled falsettos which is the two one x squeezed together um even accidentally despite them feeling very disconnected um accidentally foreshadows one another despite not always being intentional i could see that but the show went on to get um, Broadway as a full musical on April 29th of 1992 and closed on June 27th of 1993 after 487 performances, 23 previews. It won the Tonys for Best Book of a Musical and Best Original Score, which is pretty good. And it covered the topics of um, homosexuality and the AIDS crisis many years before Rent did and much better than Rent did. Wow, you're really bringing out the high praise. Are you saying this is better than Rent? Yeah, it's better than Rent, believe it or not. Better than Rent. Yeah, better enough that it even had a revival in September of 2016, starring Andrew Rannells, Christian Borle, Stephanie J. Block, Anthony Rosenthal, and Brandon Uranowitz, which is the version that you and I have watched. Rent didn't get a revival because it got evicted because they never paid the rent. Also because it ran for 10 years and it didn't really need to be revived that soon. Oh. That's the much sadder I guess you're right reason. About that. The much sadder reason, he says. <laughs> um, so instead of talking about falsettos as a whole right away, I figured the best way to talk about these is to talk about their individual plays. And Andrew, do you think that's the best way as well? No, you're throwing a curveball at me. It seems like these are just really cohesive and should be talked about <laughs> as one. We'll do that at the end. But right now, let's just break it up into sections. My father's a homo. My mother's not thrilled at all. Father homo, what about chromosomes? Do they carry? Will they carry? Who's the homo now? My father said that one day I'll grow up to be president. And that idea's not so wild. I don't need the life of a normal child. So let's talk about March of the Falsettos. It takes place in 1979, New York City, and involves Marvin, his psychologist, Mendel, his wife, Trina, and his son, um, Jason. And, of course, his boyfriend, Wizzer. Wizard. Wizzer. W it's Wizzer? Wizzer, not Wizard. I, I'm telling you, the, for the entire, at least the first half, I thought it was Wizard. Mm -mm. Like, I thought he was freaking Gandalf. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm really, I'm not, I'm literally not kidding. Like, this isn't a joke. Uh, it's just funny because now I just see Andrew Randall's as Gandalf saying, You shall not pass. <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess that is kind of funny, but I really thought that was his nickname. I thought he was Wizard. No, his actual, like, name was Wizard Brown. That is his birth name. Uh, I'm going to name my kid Pisser. <laughs> But Marvin's main goal, as he states at the very beginning, is he wants to have a tight knit family with his ex-wife, his son and his new gay lover. (sighs) That's not awkward at all. I'm just going to be honest. That's like that's perfection right there. But the irony is that Marvin doesn't see the the reason why that would be messed up in any way. He wants this the way it is. So I want it. Therefore, that's what it should be. Right. Uh, No, actually, that's not how reality works. That's not how racial relationships work, I I don't think. And that's the way that Marvin's brain works throughout the entirety of March of the Falsettos. I want this thing. Why can't you let me have this thing the way I want it specifically? It's like a game of chess. (laughs) And while he's dealing with that crisis of wanting that family unit, his son is dealing with whether or not he's going to be a homosexual too because his dad is gay as well as several other issues yeah so he's feeling like really worried about like if my dad's like this does that mean i'm like this and the way that they live is not the way i've ever seen anyone live and it's weird and i don't like it like so far as just because his father finds like the pitcher at a baseball game attractive he's like well they that's what caused them to lose the game thanks dad can we talk about how creepy everyone is in this We can, but let's bring out the creepiest character of them all. (laughs) Okay, yeah, let's bring him out. Bring him on down. All right, Dr. Mendel. Or Dr. Mendel, as some people call him. (laughs) He is Marvin's psychologist who then immediately starts treating his wife, who he has very overt sexual feelings for. Well, I mean, he's creepy. (laughs) I think it's partially how he's portrayed, though. I think that they want him to be creepy. I don't know. It's my opinion that that role has never, ever been casted right. So everything that he says comes off as flamboyant as opposed to neurotic. Um, Everyone gets like these skinny, like big, broad actors like Chip Zion and Brandon Uranowitz, who are very talented, but I don't think are right for that role. I think someone like Dan, Dan Fogelman, um, I think that's his name, um, the guy from Spelling Bee or even Josh Gad when he's reined in a bit would be really good choices for that. Someone big with that like innate masculinity to them. The way he's portrayed right now, he just seems like he's kind of like a. Just creepy, just straight creepy. It's just the whole thing is portrayed creepy. It's strange. Like he's he's used (laughs) both using his position to try to get closer to Trina and her son, as well as like um, it's it's uncomfortable. It really is uncomfortable. Does she sleep naked? Like his unprofessionality almost makes me like he is easily the least likable character in a a show full of flawed characters. (laughs) Well, the thing is, I would say that's only for the first half, though. Yeah, his character entirely flips as soon as he marries (laughs) Trina. Yeah, like the whole thing. It's like, oh, it's not creepy anymore. Now he's married. It's fine. (laughs) It's like, what? (laughs) Like, if you deliver those lines a little bit more reined in, I feel like they could really work. Like, if he's like actually trying to slip those like cues in a bit more subtly and he's trying to hide it and Marvin sees through the bullshit like that could like lead to like more cringe comedy. That's like a little bit more realistic as opposed to the very broad, very broad, like serial killer comedy. Yeah, it's less like a it's less like a cringe comedy and more like just dark comedy. Because if you're going into this blind without knowing exactly where it's going, you think that this guy is going to, like, stalk this poor woman that's gone through enough and trying to deal with both her gay ex-husband and her crazy son. I didn't. I thought he was going to be the villain. I thought he was, like, (laughs) the guy. (laughs) Like, really? (laughs) I'm not even kidding. The first time I watched it, I was like, oh, my God, this guy's fucking creepy. (laughs) I was like, it's in like when he proposes, I'm like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you doing? 
hey, can I come talk to your son? Uh, no. <laughs> don't no, come in my house. Please don't come into my house. <laughs> <laughs> but together, Trina and Marvin want their son to see a psychologist because of all the things that are running through his head. And therefore, that brings Mendel closer into their lives. A psychiatrist. Yes. What did I say? Psychologist. Sorry. Psychiatrist. They're two very different things. They are, but they sound way too similar, and a lot of people mess it up. Yes. Including myself. You, specifically. Okay, I mean, he's creepy. He's I think cre- he was the creepiest. He's creepy, um, but it, like, fades away, and he becomes, like... It's strange. Like, everyone's flawed in this. Like, everyone is very, very acutely flawed in this show. But none of them feel quite as... Like, we're supposed to feel like Marvin's the dangerous one, but really, Mendel feels the most dangerous. (sighs) Um, But he's not the only one, I don't think. Like, Marvin does feel creepy. Well, Marvin doesn't Uh, feel creepy as much as he feels territorial. Yes. I think the only person that doesn't seem creepy is Wizard. Wizard and Jason. No, Jason's creepy, too. (laughs) Jason's a different type of creepy, though. Jason's like a horn dog. Okay, he's not a horn dog until the next play. Oh, you're right. You're right. But he's he comes out there. and He starts laying down that locker room talk, man. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, he yes, he does. While Mendel is seeing Jason for his psychiatric work, um, he falls in love with Trina and Jason basically takes the father figure role on to Jason and or onto Mendel and is like, hey, this is a good deal you're getting out of this. You won't hurt my mom like my jerk ass gay father did. So go go and take her. Then we're going to talk about how Marvin is trying to force Wizard into the homemaker wife role when really that's like removing all autonomy in Wizard's life. Wizard is basically a playboy that wants to go out, have fun and party. And Marvin's like, I want you to make me dinner and have it ready while I pay for the bills. Um, Yeah, Marvin's uh, abusive. Like not just like he's both mentally and physically abusive. And by the end of the show, Wizard leaves him because he's like, I don't need this shit right. I don't need this. Good for him. Which I mean, really, like, that's the best part of the show and leads to my, fav- my second favorite song and act um, in March of the Falsettos. I mean, he beats his boyfriend and his wife. Like, what is wrong with this guy? <laughs> he's just straight up abusive. He's like a bad person. He is. And it's interesting because in this time, like in the late mid 80s to early 90s, all gay representation had them as like these godlike figures, the gay best friend or like Angel from Rent, who does no wrong despite killing a dog, but is viewed in the eyes of the (laughs) viewed in the eyes of the writer as this perfect thing. Because in those days, if you are going to have gay representation, you have to make them perfect. And that's why falsettos like everyone is flawed. Everyone is either a dick, very flawed, suicidal. All of them are have their issues. And that's what sets them really apart except for wizard yeah wizard wizard has issues like what um, aids <laughs> um no he's a bit of a floozy he cheats on marvin i don't remember that part it's like an offhanded line like wizard doesn't know how to see what a joy's monogamy what a joy is saving one's joy for one man wizard screws too much to see what a joy's monogamy what a joy is saving his joys for one man. Oh, yeah. I guess I didn't catch it. It was fast. It was one line. I mean, isn't maybe that's not true, though. What if he didn't cheat on him? I don't know. That's how I interpreted it. But the thing about William Finn dialogue is or lyrics is that they're very there's multiple ways to interpret them. Like that could just mean that he was a he was somebody who slept around and then, you know, and that's just bringing that back, you know. Mm-hmm. And then um, after Mendel proposes to Trina, Trina is very confused about how she's feeling because all these men in her life literally act like assholes or children. Yeah. And then we go into the song that yeah. everyone loves. <laughs> Of the falsettos. Come here. One foot following the other. T 
teach it to your brother, make him march, march, march of the falsettos, march of the falsettos. Oops. I want to say I didn't like this part. <laughs> All this right. This part was... It was too weird. It didn't make any fucking sense. Describe what happens <laughs> for the audience. Uh, well, at the beginning, Alice is chasing a white rabbit, <laughs> and then she gets sucked down a rabbit hole, and that's when Tweedledee and Tweedledum and Tweedlederp and Tweedledimp <laughs> all come out, and they start singing this song. Um, and it's... Uh, Everyone's yeah. <laughs> it's hard to describe it, Jess. Can you can you come in and help me out here? So Trina has this conflict where she doesn't know if she should accept the proposal. She goes a little crazy, and then she sees a vision of four men dressed all in white with their faces hidden, um, singing about the march of the falsettos. And yes. singing in a falsetto. It's a little bit annoying. Well, it's supposed to be. Um, it's supposed to represent how men are basically these childish, useless things. It definitely does portray them as annoying. <laughs> but it kind of annoys me. <laughs> the song itself is like a playground taunt. And they're all singing in like a high-pitched, annoying voice on purpose. And it's like, eh, it's, it actually is annoying. <laughs> Well, March of the Falsetto is in description of the writer William Finn sees it as like this masculine thing of marching as militaries do being done by these men who are dressed goofily and singing as high pitch as they can and turning it on its head. I suppose so. And I can see that. And I applaud them for the creativity. But I didn't like it. That's fine. I'm. That's fine. But at the end of it, Trina decides <laughs> to accept Mendel's proposal and... Marvin goes a little crazy. Tell me, Trina, what was the impetus? Sorry, Trina, look in my eyes. Really, Trina, this is ridiculous. Jesus, Trina, how I despise your need for stupid conversation. You are trying to ruin my sleep. I'm sure you chose him to make me look bad. How could you ever deny what we had? Is this the part where he beats her? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't cool. It's very weird That's when the cool. first act of a musical's climax is literally a man beating his ex-wife. What I always wonder here is, how does he keep getting back into her house? <laughs> really, though? He's, like, always there. I mean, he has, legally, he has to be able to see his son. I imagine it's, like, on one of those dad weekends where he's supposed to come and pick up his son, because he does mention later that he does get his son on the weekends. Um... And he just shows up and goes on a crazy raving rant as soon as he gets like his wedding, the wedding invitation of his ex-wife to his psychiatrist. How difficult would it be for Trina after she gets hit in the face by this guy to just get full custody? I don't know. In 1979. <laughs> it's all fucked up is all I'm saying. This whole fucking thing. This whole first act is really fucked. Yeah, but then she admits that she never regrets being in love with him and just says, hey, let me go. Everything will be fine. And that's I'm not going to lie. That's actually my favorite song. It's just I love how all, everyone's voices mesh together so well. Yeah, but do you think that she should have forgave him for for beating her? I don't know. It's complicated because they have a son together, but probably not. <laughs> probably not. Do you think it's OK that the uh, second act just completely ignores this? I don't know if it's okay, but it's two very different stories. And in the end, it feels like almost immediately after it happens, Trina forgives him. Marvin is unforgivable. Marvin kind Mendel of is unforgivable. Is... Mendel's a weirdo. Um, <laughs> the whole first part feels like a like a dark comedy that they somehow tried to spin into like a like an uplifting story almost. <laughs> <laughs> and then after all that is done marvin finally has the heart to heart and connects with his son he discovers that all this relationship bullshit has n can't hold a candle to the love that he feels for his son and he finally actually shares the stage with him and looks at him in the eye and gives him like advice kid be my son what I've done to you is 
rotten Say I was scared I kept marching in one place Marching in time To a tune I'd forgotten I loved you I love you I meant no disgrace This here is love When we're talking Face to face And then that is how the March of the Falsettos ends with uh, father and son finally connecting. Okay, can we talk about chess? Yeah, let's talk about the representation of chess in the first act. That's dropped. In what the, the hell act. does chess? What the hell does chess mean? I want to hear your theory. I don't have a theory. I don't think it has a meaning in this. I think they just use it. Um, okay. One is that chess represents sex. And it's weird that Jason is having doing sex by himself, masturbating, and everyone thinks that that's weird because you don't know who your partner is. Whereas Wizard and Marvin, when they're playing chess, it is obviously like a sexual experience where they're kind of one-upping the, each other. So you think chess is sex? I think it could be. The other one is just like a mental one-upsmanship. Jason thinks he's smarter than everyone else because, and he shows that off by being able to beat himself at chess. And Marvin uses it as something to hold over Wizard's head as like, this is why I'm better than you. The second one seems more accurate. I think that either and could. The second one... Because I'm trying to tie it back to Jason's theme of not knowing who he is sexually. I'm going to be honest, though, the second the first one makes the second act really creepy. <laughs> All right. Um, Just because of how how it ends. Right. OK, yeah. Yeah. I get what you mean. <laughs> um, OK, let's talk more about the first one, because I, I think I have more to say about the first part. I'm sure you do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about. The structure of it, because it really is structured like um, almost like a Charlie Kaufman story (laughs) where it kind of meanders and the narration churns and how everyone kind of just starts in these relationships. And the only relationship that really develops from beginning to romance is um, Mendel and Trina. Um, Actually, there's also Marvin and Jason. Yeah, that's that's there, too. But we don't know anything about how their relationship was before Marvin left the family for Wizard. Yes. Which I feel like is underdeveloped just because I'd like to know what how they were before he became a homosexual. And that really isn't explored in in trousers either. Would it be interesting if he had left for Mendel? No. And then Mendel went for Trina and then they were all just a happy family. It would have been perfect. (laughs) <laughs> it would have been way too complicated and we would have lost wizard who is a fun character want to talk about a few of the songs real quick while we got the second to talk about the first act yeah let's do it let's do it um i really really liked um um trina song um not the song entitled trina song but her song i'm breaking down With her is not so bad. It's just he's so damn happy that it makes me so damn mad. I wanna hate him, but I really can't. It's like a nightmare how this all proceeds. I hope that wizard don't fulfill his needs. Don't is wrong, sing along. What was the noun? I'm I do like that song, but it's also. <laughs> one of the darkest parts of the whole thing. How so? I mean, it's fucked. <laughs> the whole thing is fucked. <laughs> but it's so funny. Jess, what do you think chopping up bananas represents? Chopping off a man's dick, obviously. How is that not fucked? <laughs> <laughs> 
it's funny it's like so dark it's hilarious i wasn't laughing i'm gonna be honest with you that was really fucked up (laughs) (laughs) but her voice stephanie j block is so fucking talented dude it feels like that song should have been in the the part the the like in in trousers section though it was it was and then they moved in here because it was a good song fun fact oh okay so what i'm trying to say is it's out of place and i guess i'm right <laughs> <laughs> i think it fits pretty well and it lets us get into her head and i feel like it gives us a well-needed explanation of both her opinion on the wizard and her opinion on the new dynamic that her husband her ex-husband really wants it doesn't make sense in terms of mendel though how so during that section she's falling in love with mendel or I, I think she is it doesn't make sense that she's saying she's breaking down when in all reality she has a, a blossoming relationship yes but you can't just hide away your feelings for your ex-husband like i believe she genuinely loved marvin and they have a son which means that she can't just cut marvin out completely so anytime that she wants to like have her son see have a relationship with her father she has to see the man that her husband left her with as the reminder of what she isn't she does not have a banana no and that makes her so angry she wants to destroy his bananas i think mm-hmm. it fits pretty well like i i understand what you're saying but i think moving it into falsetto our march of the first falsettos was a good move well i think it fits structurally into the storytelling and that the story would be lesser without it i suppose because and yeah we got trenna's the, uh... song later where she's like i'm tired of all the happy men who rule the world and all that which is beautiful but i don't think it gives us really an opinion on the entire situation she gets really upset at men. Rightfully so. Like, have you seen the men that are in her I life? I wanted to love you. I only wanted to see my face in yours. Jason's wild. Save this child. How he adores and hates me. It really killed me when you took those vows. Don't misunderstand. I'm in demand. And anyhow, we're through. I never wanted, I wanted, I never, 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 never wanted to love you. I never wanted to love you. I never wanted to love. All right, so, Andrew, overall, what is your thoughts on just March of the Falsettos as a one act play? I feel like they should have went darker. Like, how dark would you go if Andrew was writing March of the Falsettos? What would it be? I, I'm not sure where I would have went with it, but I feel it, it, it begs to be a dark comedy, um, but it never goes there. I think March of the Falsettos is a really effective Charlie Kaufman esque like family dynamic story that is really brave, especially considering the time it was released. And I really appreciate very specific elements of it, such as the fact that it represents homosexuals as something flawed and actual human beings as opposed to like these devices made for the main characters to feel better about themselves. I think especially in the Lincoln Center performance, it is amazingly well performed in that every song is solid and really it goes by so fast and tells the story so concisely and so perfectly that i don't have very many complaints with it yeah i I want to uh, elaborate that i don't think it's bad i think it is uh it is pretty good um and i liked it a lot more than i liked the second part which is surprising because most people prefer the second part Which is surprising to me. (laughs) Hey guys, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the podcast, but we're here to shill at you. Yay. (laughs) That's my favorite thing to do. That's that's my uh, that's my game. All right. Please subscribe to us on iTunes and leave us a review. It's our way of getting viewed and getting up there on the new and noteworthy list. We really want that. Also, find us on Spotify, Stitcher and all the other podcast websites. Uh, check us out on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals. On Instagram at Musical Theater Lives. YouTube, Musical Theater Lives. 
And please, if you have any questions, recommendations, thoughts, or just anything that you want to say at us, email us at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. We always read them and we will respond. We'll probably respond to them on the show. Also, a reminder that we are currently having a raffle for anyone that is going to leave us a review on iTunes. If you leave a review, you'll be automatically put into a raffle for a $20 Amazon gift card. So, if you leave a review, you have a chance to win. And you're very likely to win, because there's barely any reviews. Just letting (laughs) you know. Exactly. So, thank you for listening, and let's get you back to it. Lovers come and lovers go, lovers fight and sing fortissimo, give these handsome boys a hand, welcome to falsetto land. Nancy Reagan, meanest and thinnest of the first ladies, moves into the White House. Yabba-dabba. It's the 80s, Yabba-dabba. ooh the 80s, Yabba-dabba. what a world we live. Welcome to Falsetto Land. The year is 1981, and we pick up the story basically a few years after we left off with two new characters, Dr. Charlotte and her lover, Cordelia. Um, So this is a very, very different in tone for the first act, but very similar in a lot of ways, too. Um, Similar how? I'd say similar in both like song structure, <laughs> like the songs very much feel connected to the first one, as well as the narration being tied by Marvin's per- point of view. I know it's a follow up to the first part, but it kind of just ignores the first part in a lot of ways. I feel like <laughs> um, I think it addresses it in a lot of ways. I feel like it, it feels like two separate episodes of a TV show or they'll reference things that happened last time, but they won't like really bring it up. Like Trina doesn't bring up the fact that Marvin hit her ever. That's never brought up. There's there's a lot of different stuff that's never really brought up. But then there's um, things that I think are paid off really well, like um, Marvin, who is like such like this competitive asshole in the first half with Wizard. Then when they get back together and they start playing racquetball together, um, um, Wizard finally finds a game he can beat Marvin at and it just pisses Marvin off so much, which I think is a really good like reference to the chess playing in the first act. Let's kind of get into the story here. All right. The story basically is um, Marvin and Wizard get back together while because of basically their mutual relationship with Jason. Jason invites Wizard to one of his baseball games, and through that, Marvin and Wizard get back together. And basically, everyone has their individual happy couples. Cordelia, Dr. Charlotte have like their great couple. Um, Mendel and Trina have a good marriage, while well, has its bumps all together, like he can't even stay up for sex anymore and she's still very jealous of the fact that wizard and marvin are a thing and marvin and wizard actually seem to have a healthy relationship now (laughs) yeah like everyone's happy which means that everything won't be happy very long (laughs) everything will not be happy uh because of aids Yes, Um, they're all planning Jason's bar mitzvah, like trying to get that together and the backdrop. But over time, Dr. Charlotte finds out there's this disease that is killing a lot of homosexual men. And of course, of course, the man who has been absent from this family unit who just came back now has that disease. Why couldn't have been Marvin? Or Mendel. Not men. Why would Mendel have AIDS? Just because fuck him. <laughs> I, I mean, in the second part, I think in the second part, he's very likable. I think Mendel like grows a lot. And I think like his relationship with Jason is very, very compelling in the second part, where in the first part, it felt like a tool. I, I feel like this is one of the big disconnects is I feel like Mendel is a, a completely different character in the second part, basically. <laughs> just like not even the same character whatsoever or when he settles down he becomes much more of a human being as opposed to like a giant cartoon flamboyant character <laughs> i mean you could say that or you could say that they just fucked up the writing and accidentally forgot that he was creepy <laughs> <laughs> or they just never thought he was that creepy to begin with <laughs> which may be worse <laughs> <laughs> uh, so wizard we discover that Wizard has AIDS when he basically passes out while playing racquetball with Marvin. 
and he takes him to the hospital and Andrew Randall's performance where he literally like because in the first act and like most of the second act, um, he's like this very polished, dressed beautifully, um, always poised, always with grace um, character. And then you just see him in that like that hospital gown wearing that shitty beanie that they make them wear and like m- like there's a lot of cool theatrical tricks used like um, when he plays racquetball the first time he's it's like super tight on him and then when we see him playing racquetball again they give him like looser clothing so it looks like he's lost a ton of weight yeah and that goes the way that you'd expect um, Jason doesn't want his bar mitzvah because his um, father's boyfriend's dying and he doesn't want to lose a good friend so they decide to have the Jason's bar mitzvah and wizard's hospital room and at the end of that wizard basically walks off stage and dies marvin and him have a last duet where we see wizard dressed exactly how he was at the beginning and he dies leaving marvin alone again rest in peace wizard (laughs) um do you think uh do you think he'll come back as gandalf the white Uh, can we talk about um one interesting thing with your synopsis of the second part um did you notice that you didn't mention a certain set of characters whatsoever (laughs) um i did i mentioned them once when she's the doctor that discovers there's aids oh okay yes yes um, why were they added to the story? They were added so we'd why have Dr. Here? Character that could have AIDS as well as a caterer for Marvin and Trina to fight over. They are so pointless and I think they should just be cut out like, entirely. I, I don't see why they're here at all. I just don't get it. Because you're saying either uh-huh. cut them out of the second half or add them into the first half somewhere. Honestly, I would prefer just cut them out of the thing entirely because they have no plot relevance, really. I love their addition to Unlikely Lovers because I love the harmonies in that song. And I feel like, oh, I mean, that's, that's worth it. It just I would I feel like it would be better if it was just more focused on the same characters from the first part. I mean, it's not like the second half doesn't focus on them. There are cutaways, though, to like there's like they cut away for like a couple scenes, like maybe two scenes to just these two new characters that we know basically nothing about. They're Marvin's friends, and they are Jason's godmothers. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. They're Jason's god... Who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> they live you, next door, and they are lesbians. You've known them for at... You've known them for at most, like, what, two years, and they're their godmothers already? C- c- get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think they're people... He, like, I'm very interested in, like, how Marvin knows these people. Like, were they I mean, Marvin's just, friends or were they Trina's friends? Or did they just, like, walk into his house one day and he's, like, too afraid to tell him to leave? <laughs> just like Marvin could just waltz into Trina's house? I don't know. I'm not, like, super upset about it, but it really just... It already feels like a jumbled kind of mess a little bit, and it just... Now you have these two additional characters that are, like, not even really needing to be there at all, and it's... Okay... <laughs> You know, I, I I don't really get it too much. Now, you say you're you prefer act or March of the Falsettos to far falsetto land. Why is that? Um, it feels like a more cohesive story. It feels more uh, is everything that's introduced in that is pretty much resolved at the end of it. There's not there's no loose ends, really. It like the second act basically feels unnecessary. <laughs> Yeah, but it's got Andrew Rannell singing You Gotta Die Sometime, which is amazing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but like, I, I prefer his ending in the first part where he he's like, OK, I'm I'm free from this asshole. <laughs> well, he's definitely free from that asshole now. He gets back with that asshole and he misses him and then he dies. And it's like, OK, <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> Marvin feels like a very different character in Act 2 than Act 1 as well. Yeah, suddenly he's not a dick. <laughs> suddenly I he's mean, much dick. less violent. 
he's like a little bit of a dick like when they're playing racquetball but that's about it it's not nearly as bad he's just competitive really that's it yeah like i feel like all of the nuanced flaws that they had in act one is kind of removed I, I hate to say it this part the second part reminds me much more of rent than the first part does Ooh, you said it and i don't like it i mean it you know how you were talking about oh all of them have flaws in the first half right they don't in the second half I mean, Trina falls in. Trina is damned a lot in the second half. Like her character is really damaged in act two. Like she's just wife figure. She is an archetype. Yeah. And then you have the the two lesbians who I I feel like they basically function as the two perfect gay characters. Um, I would agree if like Cordelia wasn't such a failure at like making stuff but she and she's jealous of her wife and her career our wife yeah but her the, girlfriend. the doctor one the doctor one is essentially angel <laughs> to to an extent i like, i don't think that doctor one murdered not a dog that bad. <laughs> not that bad okay i'm not saying it's as bad as rent all i'm saying is that i think some of the flaws that we put onto rent this does show Maybe you're just thinking it's more like Rent because one of the actors from Rent is in it. I didn't even notice that. I'm going to be honest with you. Joanne was the doctor. If you disagree, that's fine. I'm just I'm just throwing it out there that I I feel like they did go and remove a lot of the um, character from all the characters in the second half. But then again, like they're thrown into crisis when crisis comes you can't really worry about the petty things of like the shit going on well maybe this story shouldn't have been about aids <laughs> well i think it needed to be about aids but maybe it shouldn't have used these same characters i agree but then again like as just this one act thing oh, like ignoring the first half does it work i would say it works okay it does not work as well as the first half. What did you feel about the ending? Because I remember seeing this in theaters and being surrounded by sobbing, like sobbing teenagers. Did you feel emotional at the end? Like anything? <laughs> not really. <laughs> Man, you're a soulless I, I, monster. <laughs> I mean, I, I obviously I was upset a little bit, but I wasn't like I wasn't that invested in Wizard's character because it didn't feel like the same character that I had watched in the first half. Hmm. You're just like committed to calling him wizard now. I, I literally committed to it, <laughs> but I, that character wouldn't have gotten back with Marvin because that character learned that he didn't want Marvin. Like you feel like the second half is just negating his arc in the first half. Essentially. Yes. <laughs> It negates it hard. Like, it's a hard negation. It's like, oh, yeah, everything he learned in the first half. Fuck that. <laughs> uh, uh, he loved Marvin from the beginning. What would he have done without him? <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about the songs in the second half. The songs in the second half? Yeah. I liked the baseball game song. That was that was a. Uh, fun a fun song i thought mm -hmm. I, I like the rhythm aspect of it yeah you're a big fan of like the sondheim syn syncopation type patter songs yes and i find that interesting and i'm a big fan of the more melodic ballads which i think may is why this da dynamic works between us <laughs> <laughs> okay because <laughs> you like very different songs than i do we're sitting and watching jason play we're watching Jason play baseball. We're watching Jewish boys who cannot play baseball, play baseball. We're watching Jewish boys who cannot play baseball, play. I hate baseball. I really do. Um, what was your favorite song then? Um, my well, favorite song. Let me song... guess. It was the ending song. No, no. I do love the ending oh. song. Oh. 
Okay. My favorite is like you gotta die sometime. That was your favorite one. Yeah, where I'm not sure if it's be- that was a good one. I will say that was a good. One. I'm not sure if it's like half performance, but Andrew Randall's just fucking destroys that song and his like personification of death, like describing it as someone that just takes him in his arms and kisses him until he's dead. Like, oh, that that would be a good that like I've never heard it sound death described so romantically. Death's a funny pal with a weird sort of talent. He puts his arms around my neck and walks me to the bed. He pins me up against the wall and kisses me like crazy. The many stupid things I thought about with dread now delight. Then the scene turns to white. Okay, you can't have a bar mitzvah in a hospital, can you? I don't know what would be stopping you. I had a birthday party in a hospital once. What the fuck? <laughs> Please tell me that story, Jess. Um, my grandma was dying of cancer. It was my birthday, and that's where we spent my birthday. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess it was uh, technically Jess? a hospice center inside of a hospital. Jess, now everyone's going to cry. <laughs> no, they aren't. Uh, but yeah, we had like ice cream like cups that we threw around the room, and everyone had them with like the fucking wooden spoons. <sighs> like the hoodsy cups? Yeah. I like Hoodsy Cups. I used to get them in school. I mean, they don't taste like ice cream. They taste like what Martians <laughs> would try to make if they were <laughs> trying to make ice cream. They taste like uh, like what Jeff Goldblum, when he teleports uh, <laughs> ice cream through his teleporter in the fly. That's what it tastes like. <laughs> uh, it tastes like your grandma's dying in a hospice center. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday to you happy birthday <laughs> you gotta die sometime jess i know that's such that's so dark thank you <laughs> okay uh, <laughs> <laughs> please don't cut that whole thing out don't you gotta leave some of that in <laughs> Which part? Okay. Which part? The part where your grandma's dying again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about the whole thing as a whole. I feel like I've already done this a little bit, so let's not like well, right. <laughs> limit ourselves too much. Let's talk about falsettos <laughs> as a whole. Um, I think falsettos as a whole works better than either individual part on its own. And I'm sure you're going to disagree with me just to be contrarian. I'm not going to disagree with you to be contrarian. I'm going to disagree with you for reasons that I've listed before, where I think the first half works better without the second half. Um, Because the first, the second half ruins the first half. I don't think it ruins it, but I feel like the second half doesn't work on its own in the same way that the first half does. And I feel like you can't have the second half without the first half. Like the second half, like all the character development we have in the first half is very very important for act two okay what i feel like is that the second half would work better with a different first half entirely okay and then the first half works well by itself so you think that william finn should have written like the second half about aids and all these characters about completely different characters with a little bit of a different first half i think that the aids part in all that needs foreshadowing the characters that you add in need to have character. But in life, um, it do- life doesn't have foreshadowing, sir. Sometimes shit just happens for no damn good reason, as Mendel says. Okay, well, stories have foreshadowing because foreshadowing is a good story te- storytelling element. <laughs> I feel like you don't need that. Life isn't a, isn't a good story. Life is a boring terrible story that yes, sucks. Yes, but you can have mini stories within life and you know what? You don't have the foreshadowing within it. Like, the story that I have this week is gonna be vi- it's not like it was foreshadowed four weeks ago when I had the different story four weeks ago. Well, if I wanted to watch life I would wake up and go outside <laughs> but you don't see me doing that, do you? Never. <laughs> so I want to have a story that is cohesive in you know, if you put a if you put a gun on the table in the first act, you see it in the second. <laughs> you know, that that shit. 
Well, some uh, I can't wait until you watch Into the Woods. I'm not even gonna lie. <laughs> like I'm real. I am super excited for what your thoughts are gonna be about that. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be bad, isn't it? You, it? It's gonna be like this, but times fucking six. No, because it's like this, but with the stuff that you want. Oh, okay. So maybe it won't be. So that's why I'm super interested. Like, I know the fans are like, I, I know what he's going to think. And I'm like, no one's ever going to fucking know what Andrew's going to think. I think a lot of people are probably going to think I'm going to like this one really like a lot. And uh, I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> <sighs> uh, you have to ruin everything, Andrew. That's I mean, that's fine. Uh, I'm just trying to be honest here. It makes the show more interesting if I'm not just like, yeah, fighting, it was great. <laughs> if we're fighting with great. one another. <laughs> the whole thing was great. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I want that podcast. <laughs> or every week, it's literally the same audio recording, except you changed. Yeah, the whole thing was great. I loved it. <laughs> This week, I'm reviewing Little Shop of Horrors. The whole thing was great. I loved it. <laughs> please, please donate on my Patreon. <laughs> the whole thing was great. I loved it. Oh, what would I, what do, would I if do if I, I had, not had not seen you? Who would I feast my eyes on? Once I was told that good man gonna skip that stage there are no answers but what would I do if you had not been my friend there are no answers but what would I do all I know is falsettos is a great piece that I enjoy greatly it gives me emotions I do like you prefer the first half to the second half but I do ex like there are parts of the second half that I like better than the first half, but it does not equal a better whole, if that makes sense. I like pieces of it. I think the first half is good. Uh, the second half, I just feel like. There's just not very much drama in the second half, to be totally honest. You say that, but a character well, dies. <laughs> I know, and that's what's uh, that's what's weird about it. Is it a character ties in the second half, but I still feel like there's just not much happening. You have even more characters, but there's only one character that anything actually really happens to, and the rest of them are just like I'd argue three. There are three characters that really get affected by it. Yeah, and then you have two more characters that are basically just there, <laughs> um, and then. <laughs> And then that's about it. <laughs> like in the first half, there's literally nobody that that doesn't have an arc of some kind. Everyone in the first half has an arc. In the second one, it's just like. Really, like two people have an arc, two people, nothing like three people, nothing happens to one person isn't even a character anymore. And one person dies. I think this is where our audience officially turns on you, Andrew. OK. I mean, that's fine. You can turn on me. I, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> he is unright. OK, well, what's your interpretation then? How many characters do you think have an actual arc in the second half? All right. All right. Maybe an arc doesn't implicitly mean quality. But it does mean character development. I think there's character development, like Wizard grows to be back with Marvin. Jason grows to be an adult and accept that, like, and instead of going down the footsteps of Marvin, like, wanting what he wants the way he wants it at the way he needs it, is learning, like, fuck, life doesn't work at my schedule the way I thought it would. And well, Jess, in the context of the full musical, though, him growing to like Marvin again is him shrinking because he's losing the thing that he learned in the first part. Well, maybe Marvin grew as a character and was deserving of a second chance. Because that's kind of what Father okay, to Son he... represents is him growing. And I feel like he's taken the lessons he's learned in the few years that have been in between. 
But did he? Because as we see in the racquetball thing, he's just upset that he can't beat him. Yes, but he's not an asshole about it. He's not mean. He's not aggressive in the way that he was. He's not fighting. I mean, he does. Just not as much. No, I think it's just like kind of like he's grown to be a better sport about things. Okay. Like, I think that's a sign of Marvin's growth. I mean, that's not for me to decide. I don't think he deserved a second chance, though. I mean, he he was really bad. (laughs) Yeah, he was really bad. (laughs) I think if if this happened in real life to one of your friends, you'd be like, you need to dump that guy again. What are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) Don't go back with your abusers, guys. Definitely get back with your abusers. I mean, they, they definitely deserve a second chance, I would say. I mean, it's no. been two years. Are <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Rihanna? <laughs> it's been two years, guys. I'm sure he learned his lesson. <sighs> he probably sang a song. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, what are your overall thoughts on falsettos? There's a lot of parts I liked. The Honestly, I liked most of the music a lot. Uh, just the structure of it was, I thought was just really poor <laughs> and I feel like it could work better with a lot of rewrites. <laughs> like keep the same songs, but then rewrite a different like story around the songs. <sighs> That's the one thing is it's like, it's hard to rewrite something like this where there's music written for it. You know, <laughs> what would be uh, your version of falsettos if you were rewriting it? I feel like I would just drop the second half and then make a uh, add more songs to the first half and make it longer and have it end where the first X ends. All right. All right. What is your cheese rating for falsettos, Andrew? It's like a block of cheese that someone hasn't cut up yet. <laughs> half of it is like pristine. The other half is kind of falling apart. No, it's it's just like a a full brick of cheese that you can't really eat it because it's not cut up. Like someone has to prepare it. Like no one's prepared the cheese. Hmm. Y- right. You know what you get? What I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. I, on the other hand, I know no one comes here for my opinions. I love falsettos. It is a very important part of musical theater history, as well as representation of homosexuality in the theater world. Um. I th- it has specific things that I really like, and I feel it does a lot of things that Rent tries to do a lot better in a more effective way. Is it perfect? Probably not. <laughs> now, I'm not saying any of the things that you just said are not true. I'm just saying that I didn't like love it. <laughs> I think the st- songs by William Finn are 100% the strongest part of it altogether. Yes. And I feel like it is emotionally compelling and builds on the characters enough that sh- even though the second half does um, is a bit more detrimented, I feel like you're still willing to carry it on and you still have the emotions uh, by the end of it. And you're all you're all fair game to agree with Jess on this one and post all the negative shit about me in the comments. Just remember the premise of this. I love musical theater because it is the genre that I was raised on and adore. Andrew is new to this world, and this is just like it's a fun experiment of him reacting to things that we think are normal and commonplace. So if you're going to get angry, remember the premise of this show and take a breath. Well, nevertheless, thank you guys for watching. I'm really appreciative that you've got through us this far to our ninth episode. Wow. Next week is lucky number 10, man. Yeah, we're uh, we're on our way. <laughs> yeah. Um, please, if you could um, write us a review on iTunes. Tell other people to write reviews. We've got a couple great reviews. In fact, we're starting up a contest for iTunes. For all the reviews that we get on iTunes, um, at every five episodes, we're going to do a drawing of the reviews. We're going to give whoever wins the drawing a $20 Amazon gift card. So write a review. You could be a winner. Be honest in your review. Don't just say it was great, but be honest. And even the negative reviews can win. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, consider this. There's barely any reviews for this. You're pretty much guaranteed to win. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) (laughs) if you go up there and review, you're more than likely going to win. 
So by episode 15, we're going to pull a drawing and see who wins. So be sure to keep listening by episode 15 so that you know if you're a winner. And if we read your review, be sure to send us your email at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. And uh, try not to be too negative to me. Go easy on me, boys. Yeah, especially about this. Um, please, we're also on Spotify, Stitcher, at Musicals with Cheese. Follow us on Twitter. Tell us what you thought of this episode. We're at Cheesy Musicals. Follow us on Instagram at Musical Theater Lives. Our YouTube page, Musical Theater Lives. And thank you guys for watching. We're really appreciative that we're just keep on growing and things are getting better with every episode and we're getting more and more response and interest. We got some amazing things coming up like episode 11. I know you guys are going to get a real kick out of. Uh, I'm excited. We're all excited. We're all excited and we'll see you next week. I'm Jess. And I'm Andrew. We'll see you around. Uh